the sons of the living God ministry, and we come here in the name of Jesus Christ. We're speaking out of the out of the New King James today, Amen. For those of you following along, um, basically the topic um, that the Lord gave me in my heart is um, is conversations with God. What does that look like? What does that sound like in our life? How does that reverberate to other people? How does it reverberate within our own souls when we speak to Almighty God? And we ask him on behalf of our family. We ask him on behalf of his church. We ask him on behalf of the lost and the homeless and those people that perhaps don't have the opportunity um, or the ability to even. There's people that are so less privileged than us when it comes to the gospel around the world because they it, it'll cost them their lives to be caught with part of the scriptures in some countries. You know, so we want to take advantage of our opportunities, not only to have conversations with God, but to allow our conversations to impact others. Amen. Uh, we see time and time again in the scripture, conversations that took place that made up what we call now the Bible. Amen. All scripture is inspired of God. He inspired holy men to write down the scriptures. Amen. So, and uh, so the topic being conversations with God today. And this is what I wrote in my notes. It says, what results do we see in scripture that come from man's conversations with God? A variety of different results occur as we study the lives and experiences, experiences of various characters in the Bible. And man, everybody has a testimony. And that comes from our personal relationship with God. It comes from the conversation, not only in the question that we ask God, but the direction and the answer that God gives us and how we do or don't respond towards it. Amen. And so here um, in Genesis, Adam and Eve's conversation with God demonstrates the importance of covenant and obedience. OK, um, through their experience in Genesis, sin entered the world. You know, so there, there's there's both sides of the coin there. When it comes to our conversations with God, what's the key thing about conversing with God is our response, right? Amen. How do we respond? Do we respond obediently or disobediently? In this case, in Genesis, there was a direct order given. Um, and the Lord, um, through the experience of Adam and Eve in Genesis, sin entered the world. And God's instructions to them were very simple. Nothing that they couldn't understand. Amen. It wasn't too hard for them to understand it. And yet they chose to disregard his commandment. He gave them one simple rule. And when they disregarded it, the consequences have impacted all of humanity to this very day. Through that one disregard. I say this. I say this to and make this point to express how our choices can impact others, especially the household of faith. Our conversations with God should be taken seriously. I'm sure we can all agree on that. Amen. Amen. You know, I, I, I'm pretty serious when I'm talking with God and asking him about my children and my grandchildren. When I'm talking to him about my friends and my family. When I'm talking to him about the people that I meet every day. People that I've never met, but I'll ask him because I don't know who they are. And I don't know when he's going to send them to me. But I know that it could happen at any moment. So I'm always asking him, Lord, give me the words to share. Give me an ear to listen if they need to talk and just need me to hear them. And most of all, give me a heart to love them the way you love us. Because it doesn't matter how well I speak or if I raise the dead. Or if I do all kinds of other things if I don't have love I've missed the point of the conversation that I'm having with God that is to be conveyed to other people because God is love amen and when love speaks to you it speaks a love language he speaks the love language that is eternal his word shall never fade away his godly principle and his power are forever authoritative and impacting, able to cause the dead to rise and the blind to see, the lame to walk. It amazes me that when, when John sent and said um, to ask Jesus if he was the one that they were to wait for, 
This is the same John who baptized Jesus. <laughs> but he got in a bad situation and he kind of forgot. He was in jail and he sent his, his disciples to go ask of Jesus. And Jesus, one of the key things that Jesus told them, other than that the blind were seen and the lame were healed and all this, he said, and the gospel is preached to the poor. Isn't that amazing that he would add that in there? He said the gospel was preached to every and anybody, especially those in the worst condition. Because religiosity it had it that, you know, um, a lot of the, the Jewish people, the non-Messianic Jews, the non-believing Jews, they, they couldn't sit with the Gentiles. It was considered a sin in their eyes. But see, Jesus sat with anybody who would hear him and he loved them and he instructed them and he dealt with them and he went through stuff with his disciples he went through a lot of stuff, you know, just the way we do together. Amen. And so I want to continue in the reading here. And this is another conversation to consider is what Abraham experienced with God. This conversation would develop trust and faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Amen. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat that that God spoke to Abraham some things that were not easy to grasp and to really, you know, if our flesh wouldn't, wouldn't allow us to, to embrace the truth that would cause us to trust God and experience God in such a way that it would be counted to us as righteousness by God himself. Isn't that amazing? It's one thing if a man or, or, or does or doesn't count you righteous, but when God counts you righteous... That's, that's, that's a pretty special thing. Amen? So these wonderful things can come from our conversations with God also. Amen? And it goes on, and, it, and it's, um, I'm saying Abraham believed God. It was counted to him as righteousness. He understood that God is a promise keeper. Therefore, he didn't hesitate when instructed to put Isaac on the altar. You know, um, Isaac was the son of promise, and it was promised to Abraham that in his seed all nations would be blessed. So he knew that either either God was God was going to make a way somehow. He he, he might have even been expecting that if he took um, um, the knife and plunged it into his son Isaac, that God would have done a miracle and raised him from the dead, because God's promises is true and faithful, and nothing's going to go into dismiss the promise of God to His people. Amen. God has a promise for all of us. He promises eternal life to whoever would believe in the name of Jesus Christ, to whoever would accept the forgiveness of their sins and believe in the resurrection, the atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ, the impartation of the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful promise, and we've all experienced that. Amen. We've experienced that. How many of us here were lost at one time? <laughs> it's a first-hand experience. I was very lost in the world. And God saved me through the gospel. And I read about these stories, and I read about his promise, and I read about his love. <laughs> Excuse me. Set me free. Just set me free. Glory to God. Does that mean I don't have a bad day? No. That means I have a good God. Does that mean I don't go through the storms? No. That means that God created the storm to teach me something that he's going to bring me through. He's faithful. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, so here, um, you know, the question that I put here in the in the point is, um, do we trust God this way, the way Abraham trusted him? What Isaacs do we hold on to? Is it fear? Is, is it anxiety? Is it a worry about finances, about health, about, you know, um, Whatever. I'm telling you today that God is just as faithful today as he was that very faithful day that Isaac was put on the altar by Abraham. The same God. Hallelujah. What a faithful God we have. 
says, we can learn a lot about hearing specifics from God, from Abraham's testimony. It's not enough to hear God's instruction, but we as believers must obey and be doers and not just hearers of the word of God. Amen. God has a personal conversation with us every day as believers. It's a daily thing. Jesus said that if you wanted to follow him, that you must first deny ourselves, right? We got to deny ourselves and take up that cross and follow after his lead. Those are specifics. There's an order to following and obeying the word of God. And he's there to help you carry that cross just the way he, he showed when even in the way to Golgotha. There was one, was it Simon was his name, um, who had helped him carry that cross. Think about that. Jesus had help carrying that cross. What makes you think you don't? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> but he'll help us carry that cross if we just listen to his voice. And no matter how uncomfortable that cross may seem to you, I'm telling you today, you can carry that cross and Jesus is going to help you carry that cross to the dying of yourself and coming alive unto God. Dying to sin and coming alive unto God every day, every day, every day, every day. For we're sealed unto that day of redemption. The Lord sealed the deal at the cross. He said, all you who are weary and heavy laden and burdened down with all these cares of this world, you come to me and I'll give you rest. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat how God talks to us in his word and through other people? You know? It's kind of neat when, when I'm sitting someplace and uh, all of a sudden uh, somebody comes and says, hey, God bless you, brother, or hey, man, uh, how you doing today, man? You know, I just wanted to check in on you. That's nice. That, that's, that, that's God speaking to me. That's somebody loving me when they didn't have to. To me, that's Jesus. That's what Jesus did. He didn't have to die for us, but he chose to die for our sin. He even forgave, forgave those who were crucifying him. Isn't that amazing? What a gracious God we serve. But do we trust God the way Abraham trusted him? I'm here to tell you today that it's possible because with God, all things are possible. Hey, man. Sometimes we get a little nervous to the microphone and all of a sudden this sweet sound comes out that glorifies God. And you're like, "Whoo, Lord, you're just so good like that. <laughs> hey, man, that's, that's wonderful, you know. Or, or you got hopes and dreams that are going on and all of a sudden you send off to a place across the states and, they, and, and your dream comes true. You put in a little work, a little bit of effort, and all of a sudden you see God's hand touch it. But you see, God's hand is going to move more quickly as we stay obedient and we keep ourselves sanctified in him. Amen? One of the, the, the commissions that God has given me in my heart is to be a conduit between different, different ministries. The Lord told me a few years ago, he said, son, you need to get ready. And he says, because you're not ready. And I said, why, Lord? He said, because I'm sending you into regional ministry. And I didn't understand it. I did, but I didn't. And it's starting to become clearer to me now. God starts to have me build relationships with the most unprecedented people. In Christ and all of a sudden here we are they've invited me this Sunday again for the second time to come and to help the pastor um, to actually give the Sunday morning service here at Cambria Baptist Church um, this Sunday why because of my conversations with him because he said Martin love the people because I'm like Lord they're hard <laughs> to love sometimes and he says I know <laughs> I created you guys I know <laughs> you know, and so praise God, you know, I would love to see this place standing room only and at least once a month go and just go and overflow other other places where people are gathered on Sunday with the whole 
family of faith and just show them, hey, we're, we're here and we're for you and not against you, just like our Lord and Savior is for us and not against us. I want the blessing of God to be commanded amongst his people. And that's what the scripture says. He'll command the blessing to be where the brothers gather in unity. He says it is like the dew on Mount Hermon. It is like the oil that runs down the beard, even to the, to the sash, even the beard of Aaron, he says. That's a powerful way that God gives us simple instructions, okay? Just like I spoke of earlier about Adam and Eve, their instructions weren't very hard. Well, let me tell you something. People make the, the following and obeying the instruction of God harder than it is. All we got to do is love each other the way God said to, and there will be unity, and there will be a command on the blessing, and you will we'll see the miraculous. You will see the humility and the authority of God's people. The greatest miracle I always tell people the greatest miracle you'll ever witness is somebody who was lost and got saved. Whoo, <laughs> glory. That's what it's about. Salvation, the greatest miracle, the only one that it says that all the heavens and the hosts rejoice over when a sinner gets saved. Whoo, glory to God. <laughs> That's not that difficult, folks. Not for God. He said, for my word is nigh unto thee, even in thy mouth. Isn't that amazing? The eternal word of life. Remember when Peter, when the Lord said, Peter, will you leave me also? And Peter said, Lord, wherefore will we go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. He's like, we can't get it anywhere else. <laughs> Praise God. And then God says, for my word is nigh unto thee, or near to you, even in your very mouth. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Conversations, amen? Conversations with God turn into conversations with one another about God and about each other. Amen? I'm going to go on here. Um, and it's been, I spoke of King David briefly in my notes. It says, King David began his conversation with God as a young man, a shepherd boy in the fields tending to his father's flock. All along, he was being prepared to have the courage and trust in God to slay Goliath and eventually be anointed as king. Isn't that amazing? You don't have to be, you don't have to be in your 50s or above to start talking with God and see God do miracles in your life. Could you imagine? There's David. He's got five smooth stones, but it only took one. <laughs> and he was, he was a sharpshooter with that sling. Goliath was a, was a sitting duck. You know, when you think about how good those guys in the biblical times were with their slings, they could hit a bird out of the air, flying. Much less Goliath, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sitting there in all that armor. <laughs> the conversation that David had with God was enough to build his confidence and his trust in God. Because he was with him as he tended his father's sheep. Isn't that neat that even as a child, he was a shepherd tending to the flock. And then he became a great king, tending to a greater flock <laughs> as he continued with the Lord, continued with the Lord. It says that when he, was, when he was anointed by the prophet, that the spirit of the Lord was upon David from that time forth. Are you ready to be anointed through your conversation with God? Are you ready to, to not only be anointed, but appointed in the very thing of eternal life that God created us to have? And that is a, a heart to believe, a heart to obey, and a heart to be bold as a lion and speak the truth of the love of God and the word of God amongst, amongst the dark and dying world. How many of you know that the oppressor 
of God's people is alive and well out there. He don't want us to talk. He don't want us to do anything outside of his control. But when we step out in faith, oh, glory to God. Nothing's impossible. So long as you're having that clear communication with God and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and direct every step you take. It's not always easy, but it's possible. Amen. And the benefits are amazing. And the consequences of not doing it can be catastrophic. Right? So here... You know, King David, he's a young man. He's, he's got this conversation with God. He's got this great favor with God. So, to the point where Saul got upset when the, the, the maidens were singing and they said, oh, Saul slays his thousands and David his ten thousands. It even made a king envious and jealous of him. And he was there serving that king. Making his kingdom great. <laughs> but see, God had a plan that was greater than just a physical kingdom. From the house of David. David was a man of war, so he couldn't build the temple. So that torch was passed to Solomon. But David was put in such a position that he was able to call all the master builders to prepare ahead of time. Isn't that wonderful? Everybody has a certain part to play in the body of Christ, and it's very important. Even Saul had a part to play with King David. Amen? Isn't that neat? It's kind of neat how God orchestrates everything around his servants to bring God the ultimate glory. Amen. And so here, um, what is God preparing us for in our conversations is the question there. Will we be like Saul and take on a new identity and, and commission? I'm talking about Saul who was converted into Paul now, not King Saul. Okay. Will we choose to lead others to Jesus or will, will we deny ourselves and carry our cross? When you look at the testimony of Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, he had great authority amongst Rome and the Sanhedrin. Boy, but when he met Jesus, whoo, <laughs> you know, it was, I think it was like, it was like seven years after the resurrection or so, when he had his encounter with Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. And the first thing he did is he was dropped off of his steed. Some say that he, he was blinded and overcome by the presence of God. And he said, Lord, Lord, who are you? He instantly was overpowered by Jesus. He called him Lord automatically. And Jesus said, it is hard to kick against the, against the thorns. Right? <laughs> he said, it is I. Why do you persecute me, Saul? It is I, the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Saul was persecuting the body of Christ spiritually and physically. And Jesus had such a plan for him. This is a murderous man. He said, I am the least amongst all the apostles, for I persecuted the church. But look at the great things that God did in the life and through the life of Paul's apostleship. What a great transformation. Amen. In Mark 14, 72, it says this. A second time the rooster crowed, then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. This is Mark chapter 14, verse 72, where I'm starting. So he says, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Peter had 
Various results from walking on the water with God to denying God and becoming more self-aware in that. To ultimately being transformed to the point of dying for the gospel. What an amazing result Peter experienced through his conversations with God. Amen. There was a time where, where, I mean, just in the same passage and part of the scripture, he said, you know, who do you say I am, Peter? And Peter said, I say that you are the son of the living God. And he said, blessed art thou, Peter, for flesh and blood has not shown this to you, but my father in heaven has. And upon this foundation, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. <laughs> Hallelujah. The father revealed it to Peter. And Jesus said, upon the foundation of this spiritual principle and awareness, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What a result. What a, what a, what a declaration that Jesus said to Peter at that minute. But you see, then Peter kind of turned around and started thinking about him going to Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen. He's like, man, you know what, man? Maybe, maybe I don't know, man. You know, I don't know if you should go there, Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus rebuked him, and, and, and you know the story. So Peter, you know, Peter went through some stuff with Jesus. Peter walked on the water with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> How many times has God carried us through the deep, through the darkness of the deep, but because Peter stepped out in faith, okay, regardless of other conversations, at that defining moment, he stepped out in faith and he started to walk upon the water because he told the Lord, Lord, if it is you, tell me and I'll come, call me and I'll come to you. And he said, it is, fear not, it is I, Peter. Peter got out of the boat. And even when he started to lose focus, on that conversation, he started noticing that the waves and everything were, you know, there was a storm on the sea. <laughs> he started to sink, but it says that immediately Christ grabbed him and pulled him back up onto the top of the water and they walked back to the boat. That conversation took place and it brought Peter and Jesus back to the boat and everybody in the boat bowed and worshiped Jesus. That's the power of understanding the grace of God that helps us face each day and say, Lord, how do I answer you right now? Are you calling me out of my comfort zone, Lord? Are you telling me that I can even though everybody else says don't do it? Are you trusting Jesus no matter how many mistakes you've made? Are you laying them down and saying, Lord, I'm going to pick up the cross instead of my mistakes now. I'm going to pick up that cross, Father, and I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ with everything that's in me. To everyone that's around me. He's worthy. See, Jesus didn't go up to the cross and get one Hand nailed and go, hey, no, man. <laughs> I just said, no, he didn't do that. He gave it all because he was showing you and me that if you give it all, you gain much more than you gave. And you give your life to the Lord. Not only do you receive salvation, others receive salvation through your testimony and the conversations that we have with God. Amen. That's a powerful way to live, people. And it's in every single one of us. If we would just hear the voice and then make the choice to follow after the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So here, Peter... He was going through, in this scripture in Mark, chapter 14, he was going through, you know, some inner turmoil here. He was afraid to be crucified. Because there was something in him still that caused him to operate in fear more than in faith. At that moment. And he was reminded by the Holy Spirit, I believe, 
And in his mind, when the rooster crowed the second time, it says that he thought about what Jesus said and he wept. And that's where you see the spark of hope. Because Peter had a conscience towards what the Lord told him. Peter had a conscience about his, his doubt that became sinful. Oh, but then when Jesus rose from the dead. Whoo. What did he do? <laughs> he went back and kept talking to us. <laughs> That's amazing. He could have just ascended, you know, and just sent an angel. No, he hung out for another 40 days or so, didn't he? <laughs> and he spoke to us about the kingdom of his father. And he spoke to them. There was up to like 500 witnesses other than, other than the apostles, than the disciples at the time. It's amazing that within that conversation, that after he rose from the dead, that they went from scattering from the cross to all carrying their cross in a way that they were all martyred except for John the Revelator. They went from, from scared to committed to the death. Jesus was showing us in that. Even if they take your life, they can't take the life I gave you. <laughs> they might take your temporal life, but not eternal life. There's a lot of people that aren't going to make it. But there's a lot of people that are going to make it. Amen? Amen? We need to be a voice. We need to be a voice to those people. I want to see the drug addicts. I want to see the prostitutes. I want to see the, the dregs of society become the children of God. I want to see the people in the pews that, 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 that put on a form of godliness yet denying the power thereof rise up in power and truly become the children of the Most High God. Because if God could save me, He could save anybody. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. I understand what the Apostle Paul meant when he said of the sinners, I was the chief. But praise be to God that he has saved a sinner like me and turned me into a saint. By the grace and the mercy of God and the indwelling and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, I have a new name, I have a new song, I have a new walk, I have a new language from heaven, and it speaks of the glory and the greatness and the works of my Father God and my Lord Jesus Christ and the leading of the Holy Spirit. That is the new creation. The life I live now. I don't need to wait to get there. I, I, I'm here now. God's here now. His word's now. His love is now. It's always now with God, because now is eternal. We need to look upon the things that are above and not below, because the things below, the Bible says, are temporal. But the things above are eternal, amen? Let's go on. Um, Jesus displayed perfection through obedience to God the Father. So far as to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he said. This displays how our conversations with God will identify us as his children. The further we continue the conversation, the more we realize how close and intimately God desires to walk with us, live, and abide in us. Amen? <laughs> Isn't that neat? That's so beautiful that the Lord said that him and the Father would come and make their abode with us. <laughs> That's, that's amazing. It, my carnal mind can't grasp it, but my, but my eternal heart knows it. Because God said it. If God said it, it must be true. I'm a believer. I believe what he says. I believe it for me. I believe it for you. And anyone else who would embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. The very word of God made flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have a good God. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 12, 14, it says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness. 
without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. Here are two elements that cause us to see the Lord. Someday and even today to understand. When I say, oh, I see. Part of that is also, hey, oh, I understand. Right? Haven't you ever said that? When you didn't like understand something, but then when you finally understood, oh, now I see. I was kind of blind, but now I see. Well, I'm telling you what, when I didn't know God, I was blind, but now I see. I see God in my life. I see the evidence of his goodness. You know that song? I love that song. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. Amen. That wasn't always my song and my story. It is now. I love Jesus. He first loved me. Amen. He loved us all so much that he stepped down and died on a cross for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Whoo! Let that sink into your heart. Because when it does, it'll start coming out of your mouth. The power of words. In the beginning, God created everything through his conversation with his creation. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's just amazing. Created things that we stand by like the ocean and go, whoa. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but we're the only ones creating it, created in his image. So when God looks down into his creation and sees his children, see, because I can be walking next to, a, next to a beautiful mountain and everything else, but it's not even close to as beautiful as when I'm walking by that mountain with my children. <laughs> you know, <laughs> glory to God. That's how God is with us. What, a, what an amazing God we have. So how do we see or understand what God meant when Paul said in Ephesians 5, 14 and 7 through 17? It says, therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Amen. And we just read out of Hebrews that he said part of his will is to pursue peace with all people and holiness. Because without that, you will never see God. I want to end with the Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. I pray this is ministering to us all. I pray that it inspires you to invite a friend for next Thursday. We'll be here again. At 7 p.m. Please share this video if you're streaming live. Please share it with others. Um, God bless you all. We appreciate you guys for tuning in. That's awesome. I see Shandy Loby. <laughs> I love you, Shandy. Hey. See Maria. Jesse Thornton. God bless you guys. Jacob Thornton. God bless you, Jacob. Now, in Ephesians, Chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. It says, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct. One of the translations of the Bible says former conversations. That's the King James Version. So it's putting off the former conversations. We're talking about conversations with God. This here is your, your former conduct or your former lifestyle. The conversation with God will create a new lifestyle. Amen. And here it says, therefore, that you put off concerning your former conduct or conversation, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen? When you take it upon yourself to change your conversation, it'll change your conduct. 
It'll change your lifestyle. It'll change who you are from the core of who you are. That doesn't mean that you're not going to go through things. But it's going to change the way you respond to things. It's going to change the way things respond to you. Instead of your atmosphere impacting you to the point of failure, uh, at some point or other, your conversation with God is going to have you impact your atmosphere <laughs> to influence others to be holy, for He is holy. See, a lot of people don't teach you what holy means, so they, it, it seems like a mysterious thing you can never be. Holy speaks of, speaks of sanctification, being set apart unto the works of God. Set apart unto the life of God. Perfection, uh, per, to be perfect, in the Bible actually speaks of maturity. To be mature. To be an adult, spiritually. Amen? And that's something that we're all working on. It's something that we're all doing to some degree. There's things that you guys do that nobody else sees you do for God, and but God sees you do them, and he loves you for it. He loves that you do that. He loves that you're generous. He loves that you're caring. He loves that you pray for strangers. He loves that you pick up the hitchhiker and don't if he tells you to. He loves that you're silent when he tells you to be silent. He loves when he calls you forth to, to, to declare the glory of God that that you, you, you come meekly and you say, oh, mighty God, here I am, Lord. Speak, oh, God, your servant is listening. Amen. Jeremiah was a young man called to be a prophet amongst the people, and he said, oh, Lord, I can't do this. I'm too young. The Lord said, no. You go and whatever, whatever you do, wherever you go, don't worry. I'm going to be with you. I'll give you what to say, and don't worry. I got gotcha. you. Amen. A lot of times we feel like that young Jeremiah. We don't feel adequate. Well, the truth is we're not. Not without him. But if we obey him and we follow him and we obey him and we follow him, guess what? There's no good thing he'll hold back from you. Amen. Amen. Well, I appreciate you coming tonight. I pray you guys uh, come and invite a friend for next Thursday. I'm just praying that the Holy Ghost would give me another, uh, another um, thing to share that would bless your heart and it would bless his heart. We thank you for tuning in, and God bless you guys. Please share this um, with other people. We love you guys. Thank you. Father, I just, um, just want to um, close in prayer. Amen. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word, Father. I thank you for your spirit, O oh God. Father, I pray, Father, that healing, Father, of the hearts and the minds of your people would come, Lord. I pray, Father God, that the Holy Spirit, Lord, would touch the hearts of those believers that are listening right now, Father, and that your hand would touch them, Lord. I need not lay a hand on them. Uh, all we need is a touch of the Master, O oh God. Mighty God, touch them, Father, and change their lives. Help us, Father God, to go to that next place in glory that you've prepared for us, Father. I just thank you, Lord, for your word, your spirit, and your truth, Father God. To you be all the honor, praise, and glory. I pray all these things and declare them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God be with you. Thank you.